Welcome back everybody to this first plenary of today's last day of the Global Space Exploration Conference GEX 2021. And this first plenary of today has been organized by the Space Research Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences and it is titled Human Roads to, to Outer Space, Real and Imaginary Dangers. The panel will feature on-site and remote speakers, and it is moderated by Mr. Anatoly Petrukovich, director of the Space Research Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Anatoly, please, the floor is yours. Okay, dear colleagues, dear Professor Fechtinger, our meeting, our session today is devoted to the perspectives of safe human uh, presence in the outer space. In the outer space, it is beyond the near Earth orbit. And uh, currently, outstanding progress of space medicine after 60 years of human flights allowed long-term presence of about half, one in a year and a half in the microgravity field and the space radiation of the, near, of the low Earth orbit. Outer space flights, um, um, first of all, um, uh, have the risk of the much lesser shielding of the Earth's magnetic field on the space radiation. And uh, the limitations of a human survival in the radiation of the solar system are, are very challenging. This is the, will be the first topic of the, uh, our panel. For example, debates are still underway when conditions are more favorable for Martian expeditions during solar mean or solar max. Uh, other problems are special gravitational conditions at the moon. While human adaptation to microgravity is rather well understood, midterm several months presence of humans in just in a small gravity will definitely require very difficult accommodation scenarios and research. Finally, uh, as the um, one more effect of the outer space, uh, which is uh, often mentioned, if you we, if we work on the moon, uh, is lunar dust. It is very aggressive toxic substance consisting of fine and sharp charged particles. Um, which is known to affect the operations outside the lunar base. This list of main dangers can be uh, even larger. Um, but whatever the dangers are, they, they should be met by medicine and uh, uh, by some precautions, by some research, and by some uh, methods during the um, uh, human presence in the outer space and uh, um, after the space flight. This will be the, sec uh, this will be the second half of our panel. Um, um, and uh, finally, I would like to welcome our participants. Here in the hall, we have uh, on the side, we have Alek Arlov, Director of Institute of Biomedical Problems of Russian Academy of Sciences. That's our main organization responsible for medical support of the uh, human space flight, and he is also an academician of Russian Academy of Science. And Professor Val Valery Kolegaev, head of the Laboratory of Space Research at Moscow State University, the leading Russian institution for space radiation studies. He, on the web, uh, remotely, we have uh, presence of Ioannis, uh, Professor Ioannis Douglas, president of the Hellenic Space Center from Greece. He is also a specialist in space radiation. Hans Christian Gunga, deputy director of Institute of Physiology, Center of Space Medicine and Extreme Environments in Berlin, Germany. And Professor Bing Xian Luo, associate professor of National Space Science Center, Chinese Academy of Sciences. He is also um, representative of the radiation community. Unfortunately, Lev Zelenyi, president of Space Research Institute, Russian Academy of Science, was not able to join us today for technical reasons. So, we, we just start with radiation. And uh, uh, the, the, the first uh, panelist to speak is Professor Bing Xian Liu. Please. Uh, 
Hello? Can you show my presentation? Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk about human health risks in deep space missions. I will use human mass exploration as an example, talking about radiation effect. Next, please. The radiations mainly include galactic cosmic rays and solar particle events. The GCRs are mainly protons, alpha ions, and heavy nuclei. The flux is lower during solar max, but higher during solar mean. Solar particle events are caused by solar eruptions. The main component is low to medium energy protons, but SPEs are frequent, are frequent during solar max and rare during solar mean. So, with regard to radiation, it is a question when it's better to implement human mass mission. Next, please. Here, we use a three-year mass mission scenario to analyze the radiation effects of GCRs and solar protein events. We assume a one-year transit time from Earth to the Mars, a one-year stay on the Mars surface, and a one-year transit time from Mars back to the Earth. The left figure shows the energy spectra of GCRs during solar mean and solar max, based on the CRIM-96 model. The red figure shows the energy spectra of the solar protein events in 2003. This is the solar max of solar cycle 24. Next, please. We use Gen4 to analyze the effective dose equivalents under different shieldings. Left table shows the doses in the interplanetary. As the shielding increases, the SPE dose decreases fast. The remaining dose mainly comes from those with harder energy spectra. For GCRs, the dose also decreases as the shielding increases, but not as significant as SPEs, implying that we may need other shielding methods, such as composite materials or active shielding. The red table gives the doses on the mass surface. The mass atmosphere is equivalent to an aluminum shielding of 20 gram per square centimeters. The main dose is still from GCRs, but solar protein events with hard spectrum also contribute. Next, please. According to the results in the above two tables, we can estimate the effective dose equivalence during solar max and solar mean. It can be seen that total dose during solar mean is higher than solar max. And under the shielding of 10 gram per centimeter square, it may exceed the standard given by NCRP98. During solar max, in the interplanetary space, both GCRs and solar proton events are important radiation factors. On the mass surface, the dose of GCRs is much higher than SPEs, but solar proton events with harder energy spectra cannot be ignored. I would like to say that this is a very preliminary estimation, and a further detailed analysis will be carried out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Liu. And uh, this radiation issue is actually very multifaceted. We have several components of the radiation in outer space. The one which was known about, one, about 100 years since the first airborne experiment is galactic cosmic ray radiation, which is relatively stable and just a little bit modulated by solar activity. With the, uh, spa with the start of the space flight, one of the first discoveries were radiation belts, which uh, uh, were one of the surprise, uh, one, one of the largest surprises of the, 
uh, first years of the, the first launches of the first spa spacecraft by uh, Soviet and American uh, scientists. And finally, we have solar cosmic rays, which are uh, sporadic, but uh, um, could be very intense. So uh, the next view on this problem is by Professor Douglas. Please. Good morning. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I regret that I am not in uh, St. Petersburg today. I would love to be there, but uh, unfortunately it has not been possible for me. So the, the issue uh, of our session today are the dangers and uh, the hazards and the risks. So a general comment uh, on the risks. The risks uh, are, of course, related to the difference of various conditions uh, in, uh, according to the location, like for example, lower gravity or lack of oxygen or low temperatures. So uh, this is just a difference in the conditions. But uh, of course the risks are also related to various hazards such as ionizing radiation. Um, and uh, we have to understand both the character and the detailed spatiotemporal properties of the hazards of the environment that we intend to explore or to use in order to effectively mitigate all associated risks. Um, the risks are related both to technical infrastructure and to our own bodies. And both are very important because if the infrastructure failure fails, then this will have an impact also on the bodies, on the health of the bodies of the astronauts. By quantifying the hazards and consequently estimating the risks, we can design the appropriate protective shielding. Um, some hazards have more complicated properties and are more difficult to predict. So the main hazards we are aware of, the main interplanetary hazards, for uh, any mission beyond uh, the uh, protection of the terrestrial magnetosphere, we already heard are cos galactic cosmic rays and solar energetic particles. Uh, I would say that um, photons, hard photons like X-rays or gamma rays are uh, at least within the solar system and within uh, for the foreseeable future, not uh, a significant hazard. And the associated risks, the associated biological risks, uh, I guess that we will hear about them later from other colleagues, but just to them, uh, are two kinds, two categories, the acute effects, which are of deterministic nature, and they refer to malfunctions of various organs, and there are specific threshold doses for them, and also late effects, uh, which refer to DNA damage, mutations, and cancer development, and they are stochastic uh, with no, uh, no certain, no uh, specific threshold doses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a well-known uh, property uh, regarding the relative biological uh, effectiveness, uh, and uh, these are graphs comparing the uh, bi relative biological effectiveness of particles, uh, protons in this case, and uh, photons, X-rays. Um, and uh, they refer to the survival percentage of uh, cells, of living uh, test cells, experimental cells, on bombardment by particles and, uh, and X-rays. So this just demonstrates that uh, uh, particles are a major concern for uh, for any uh, manned mission uh, in, uh, beyond the Earth orbit. Next slide, please. Um, you mentioned uh, the relation of uh, corays and solar energetic particles. This is a graph uh, demonstrating, showing the, um, this anti-correlation over uh, a few solar cycles. On the top panel, we see the sunspot number, and we can see three consecutive uh, solar cycles. Uh, the second graph shows uh, 
energetic protons as uh, detected by the IMP spacecraft at L1. And we can see that um, we have uh, a lot of uh, solar energetic particle events uh, around solar maximum, a well-known fact. And uh, the flux is also really high, especially when compared to the cosmic ray flux, which is the bottom, which is the solid line on the bottom panel, uh, where we see that uh, the cosmic ray flux uh, has maxima uh, around the solar minima. Uh, we can clearly see it. And it is also interesting to note the sporadic events on the lower panel, again, on the lowest panel, of very high energy uh, solar protons uh, with uh, energies above 60 MeV, which are again much more abundant around solar maximum. And this poses uh, the well-known uh, issue of uh, choosing the right time for an uh, interplanetary mission, because uh, around solar maximum we have uh, sporadic but intense, uh, very high uh, flux uh, solar proton events uh, and uh, around solar minimum when we do not have the solar energetic particles we have a higher flux of cosmic rays. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so this is, this is uh, just a thought on how uh, one could uh, how we could contribute to the safety of a manned mission uh, through an example of um, uh, of uh, robotic missions. This uh, simply shows that uh, a solar energetic particle event that, uh, is, that has been detected at, Earth, at uh, the Earth orbit by um, geostationary spacecraft propagates, of course. I mean, solar energetic particles do not stop at Earth. They continue to propagate in, in, the, in the interplanetary space. In this particular we see that uh, uh, a problem created by an SCP event uh, was uh, registered at GOES-8 and GOES-9 to geostationary spacecraft. And uh, two hours later, it uh, was registered at Cassini by the Cassini spacecraft, which was, uh, of course, beyond uh, the Earth uh, orbit. So, in principle, uh, robotic spacecraft uh, could be used uh, for um, alerting uh, manned missions uh, which are beyond Earth orbit uh, in order for them to take precaution uh, measurements to uh, protect uh, the crew. So thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, that was my last slide. Thank you very much, Professor Douglas. So, the final speaker on radiation issues is Professor Kaligaya. Please. Uh, good morning. Uh, could you please my presentation? Uh, okay. Uh, after the talk of Yanis Douglas, uh, I would like to describe the condition uh, in the uh, geospace. Uh, inside the Earth's magnetosphere. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, could you please show presentation on my screen? Oh, okay, okay. Just after the first uh, space experiments, uh, scientists understood that uh, uh, space is filled by uh, energetic charged particles, and we should take into account uh, this fact when we plan the space missions. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, if we look inside the magnetosphere in the near Earth space, uh, we can see here three different populations of energetic particles, uh, galactic cosmic rays, solar energetic particles, and also radiation belts. Uh, energetic particles coming from the Earth and from the galactic, uh, you can see here uh, declined by Earth's magnetic field. Uh, this is our shield, and we are lucky that uh, we have such a shield in our magnetosphere around the Earth. Uh, but actually, some orbits of spacecrafts, just stationary orbit and Leo orbit, are partially uh, influenced by these particles because uh, energetic particles penetrate to high latitudes. 
and uh, uh, they modulated by solar activity as well and uh, in different times we can see the different regions of penetration of particles. Also this region depends on energy, uh, more energetic particles uh, can come to the lower latitudes. Uh, for example, 10 GeV particles can go to equator, uh, but fortunately this flux is very low and uh, don't, uh, um, take, uh, don't includes, uh, include it in the dose um, uh, rate uh, for the spacecraft or electronics. And uh, existence of the magnetic field also the reason for existence of radiation belts because uh, we have uh, some uh, places in the magnetosphere when we can, uh, ha can measure uh, energetic particles any time. Next fly, slide, please. Uh, Earth radiation belt consists uh, from energetic electrons and protons and we can separate two regions in geospace uh, filled by uh, particles of different uh, uh, nature. Uh, inner zone, uh, inner radiation belt consists mostly from protons, energetic protons and uh, electrons still several MeV. Uh, this region is responsible for uh, uh, multiple uh, single event effects, uh, influence on electronics. Uh, radiation belts are not symmetrical uh, due to uh, features of uh, geomagnetic field and we have one region, South Atlantic Anomaly, which intersected by uh, low uh, Earth orbits uh, any time and also International Space Station are often coming through this region and this is the reason for radiation dose uh, 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 collected by uh, cosmonauts on the International Space Station in addition to galactical cosmic rays. Outer zone uh, is uh, uh, mostly uh, consists of electrons and it is very dynamical region uh, dependent, uh, dependent on uh, solar activity on condition in interplanetary uh, space. Uh, during uh, magnetic storms, during fast uh, solar wind fluxes, uh, streams, uh, we see enhancement of fluxes that are responsible for inner uh, charging of spacecraft. Next slide, please. As about the uh, galactical cosmic rays, we know from previous reports that this is one of the uh, important factor for a long time uh, miss missions, uh, but also uh, it influences the biological uh, uh, biological uh, tissues, uh, starting from the Earth service. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the dose for the people on the Earth surface about one millisiever per year. Uh, actually, during the space, uh, during the flights on the uh, uh, through the um, uh, polar region, uh, we can got uh, 10 millisieverts per year. And uh, for the uh, astronauts on the International Space Station, uh, the dose rate is about uh, 200 millisieverts per year. Uh, but when we come to the uh, long flight, for example, for Mars, we can get uh, a lot of uh, radiation dose, uh, about uh, 1,000 millisievert uh, for the flight to Mars. But we don't take into account uh, solar energetic particles. For example, for, uh, uh, for the event on uh, 1972, uh, during one day, uh, we have uh, about uh, four zivert uh, during this event. This is a very high uh, dose rate. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, actually, inside the uh, magnetosphere, we can detect the start of the event uh, by the measurements on the geosynchronous orbit. Uh, you can see here the uh, white, uh, uh, the white <coughs> 
пікче, було і бав з рентген, а зіс з іксей іксей detection and below is the particle fluxes on the geostationary orbit. Just during 72 solar flare, the astronaut outside the spacecraft can go for zivert. This is actually a very high dose that can lead to the mortgage of the astronaut. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kaligayev. So here we, we have seen that the radiation effects are very diverse. Radiation, of course, is uh, in colloquial way, from a colloquial point of view of the general public, is the most dangerous uh, aspect of space, besides vacuum, of course. Uh, but um, effects of the um, space uh, physics are actually much, much broader. Unfortunately, we are missing today pre um, Professor Lev Zelioni. His plan was to speak about two main issues. I will just briefly name them. The first one is the issue of lunar dust. If uh, cosmonauts or astronauts or taikonauts or somebody else, uh, some other representatives of some other countries are working on the moon's surface, in the space suits, they, are, they, they, they should expect to bring some dust back on the space suits and on the equipment, back to the pressurized volume. And this results that this, uh, sub, uh, this substance, which is uh, basically was lying billions of years at the, uh, just at the surface of the pressureless body, uh, appears inside this volume, which is considered to be a safe, 100% safe zone. And still, we don't understand finally uh, how dangerous it could be in the long run. There was some, there was some experience with the astronauts on the moon, but their exposure to the dust was very small, several days. And uh, still, they no noticed and uh, put it in their reports that it, it is potentially a very dangerous thing. <clears throat> So this, of course, uh, remains uh, an issue of the future debate and future studies with the automatic spacecraft on the moon's surface. We need to understand how toxic is the dust, how it could be mechanically abrasive, and other issues. But finally, whatever is happening with the uh, physical medium in which the, the person is uh, um, placed in, in space flight, the ultimate answer to the human survivability is uh, received through medicine. Uh, how we uh, measure the adverse effects of the space on the humans, how we mitigate them and how we compensate um, them after the space flight in the, in, uh, uh, on, on the ground. So I am giving the floor now to uh, uh, our two representatives of medical community. First, please, Professor Alia Karlov. Uh, thank you. Uh, we, we have a very interesting discussion concerning uh, so-called new factors of uh, uh, influence on space, on human body, which uh, we will meet uh, when we go uh, out of, in outer space. Radiation, dust, if we're speaking about moon missions, and one more factor, hypermagnetic field, or absolutely absence of uh, magnetic uh, field in outer space, which is uh, one of the uh, high problem uh, risk for uh, future interplanetary um, main missions. And we had discussed a bit about uh, this problem too. But uh, if we uh, move forward in trying to classify the risk of uh, such uh, uh, interplanetary missions, uh, we should say it about the problem of autonomous of such flight. Interplanetary missions are the problem, have the problem of growing autonomous uh, of management uh, support of such flight. That means that uh, we should uh, change uh, absolutely even the principles of medical support of such uh, missions and uh, uh, they cannot be uh, organized on the base of our experience on the uh, lower uh, orbit. Then we should uh, modify it, uh, the prophylaxis uh, system which is now used 
make it more individual, uh, maybe use artificial uh, gravity uh, approach um, and make it more individual uh, managing. So, and then uh, the problem of modifying uh, selection of crew members, which should be based on more uh, personalized uh, approach. If we move forward, uh, we should speak about autonomous of life in outer space. Uh, autonomous of life in outer space, it's uh, first problem, uh, adaptation to uh, s uh, space. Uh, how uh, human, we don't know how human body, uh, the level of adaptation, how it can adaptation um, can, can be developed uh, if we stay in uh, space uh, conditions for a long period of time because we use, we should use prophylaxis all the time and we don't know the possibility of uh, physiological adaptation to the outer space, but this question is still open. Uh, then the life support systems uh, or another approach uh, to resources sensibility using uh, such te technique like uh, hibernation, which is uh, under the discussion for uh, now, now very, very popular team. And then the problem of extension of the human race, which is discussed now, and we are only at the beginning uh, to understand uh, how we can move on with this uh, uh, question. So, but I uh, shall, um, uh, but I would like to say that uh, uh, we shall move on step by step, uh, coping with risks, and then the real dangers become more and more imaginary. I, I think so. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Arlov. And. Uh, our final speaker is uh, Professor Gunga, and uh, his uh, talk will be on a completely different thing, but also a very interesting subject, which shows the diversity of the human life aspects of the preserving human life, safe human life in space. Hans Christian, please. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers and uh, the chairman to get the opportunity. May I have the first slide to come into my presentation. Yeah, one of the uh, well-known features uh, which are happening during a space flight is uh, the fluid shift from the lower part of the body to the upper part of the body. And it has become more and more clear that uh, during long-term space flights, this might be an issue which was not foreseen uh, some years before. Next slide, please. Um, I would like to address here a problem that might occur from two different sides. And the one side is the thermal regulation, and on the other side is that described fluid shift which happens in space. These seems to be far destructive uh, topics, but I think they belong together. What you see here is a situation of the thermal exchange from the human body on Earth with an environment and then in space. And what you see is that uh, we have a different heat transfer uh, on Earth and in space we have the problem that you can't get rid of uh, your own heat because there gives uh, or there, there are several layers of different temperature fields around you and you have no, as we call it, um, a physical convection. On Earth, it's about uh, 600 liters per minute which goes along your body, but uh, in space, this doesn't happen. And uh, from that, uh, we expected that the temperature is increasing, especially during exercise. Next slide, please. Uh, we developed a special sensor which could be non invasive place that they had. Next slide. This was only to address the sensor. And it is measuring actually not the temperature, but the heat flux uh, measured uh, at the head, at the front of the head, and it's so to say the temperature of the brain. And next slide, please. And we had an, an exercise testing on the International Space Station with uh, European and American and Canadian astronauts. And we looked how the temperature inside the body is changing in comparison to the same exercise conducted here on Earth. Next slide, please. 
Oh yeah, it, it's moving, so it's even better than I thought, but we can skip it to save time. So what you see here, we are looking only uh, on the, there you see data from the core body temperature, CBT, so the temperature in the brain, so to say, at rest and at exercise in the upper panel. Oh no, go back, please, go back. Um, and what you see here is that the uh, core body temperature is increasing already during rest, during space flight. We measured the first data point 15 days in space and the latest one 165 days in 12 astronauts. And what you see is during rest already, the temperature is higher uh, in the astronauts than pre and post flight. On the right upper panel during exercise, you see now that during a very short exercise, the temperature is sometimes increasing nearly to about 40 degrees. And that is definitely for a long-term exercise that is too high and could be at least in dangerous, uh, come into dangerous uh, levels. And we see it takes about 30 days after space flight that the temperatures come back to the normal level. Next slide, please. We therefore looked at whether a certain marker of a temperature increase is increased in these astronauts. And what you see here is a relationship between the core body temperature and uh, so-called interleukin, a uh, special transmitter, which is increasing the core temperature, something like fever. And what we um, expected to see and what really what happened is that we see there's a strong correlation with the increase in the core temperature and these markers of a getting a higher temperature um, inside the body like fever. So there is some kind of uh, activation which looks like an infection happening during long-term space flight. Next slide, please. And here we go directly now into the brain. What you see here is the blood vessels inside the brain and its connections to the next neurons and the nervous. Maybe it will reload. We have some time, so maybe it will reload in, in, a, in a moment. Yeah. Back in the system. The final speaker. We need to switch to questions. I think we'll wait a couple of minutes. Hello? Okay. Yes, we are here. We are, uh, we, you can hear you. Continue, please. Okay. Can I have the slide, please, the last slide? Yes, please. Okay. So this is inside the brain. Thank you. And now we look at the problem. Next slide, please. When we have hyperthermia, so if you have an increased temperature, then have the release of special uh, neurochemicals which increase, as it's shown here, brain edema. And this brain edema causes cell injury. We can see you. Can just continue. Your slides are on. Yeah. Okay, the slides are on. So, to make it short, this kind of hyperthermia, so increased temperature, causes probably cell death injury. And next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, it is well known now for the last uh, three to four years that we have an increase in the brain tissue volume due to a fluid accumulation. And I, well, I think this is related to the, um, on the one hand, on the fluid shift, and on the other hand, on the um, uh, hyperthermia which the astronauts exposed during long-term space flight. Next slide, please. So, um, I think that the uh, future research should go to combine research due to the hyperthermia of astronauts and other, on the other side, on the uh, brain volume um, 
increase in uh, fluid in the brain known as the space flight associated neuromuscular syndrome, which I think is really for long-term space flights uh, for the moment a very, very uh, severe problem because the astronauts will need their eyes to work and live on the International Space Station. So thank you very much. I will close here so that we get discussion, time for discussion. Thank you very much, Hans Christian. We have now about 13 minutes for questions. So the last talk just show us that there is no minor details in the human life in space. Even very simple things which we take for granted at Earth and just don't mention, don't notice them can result in some adverse consequences in space. And of some measure, at least some measures should be undertaken to uh, downplay the importance, to decrease the importance, the adverse effects of this uh, uh, physiological or even physical effects. So we are now switching to questions. We have three questions. So the, the first questions, the first, I will start with the last question, which will, will, is appearing here. So, should the first human mission to Mars be with a national or international crew from psychological point of view? So, I would like to ask our medical people to answer. Uh, please, Professor Alov. Uh, normally, I think that uh, first and uh, next uh, missions uh, to Mars should be based on international level. And uh, I think that future interplanetary missions as a whole will be international level based uh, and have an international crew. That's why we work very hardly with this problem. Um, uh, uh, psychological uh, uh, interoperability of uh, uh, crew members of such long duration missions. But the last part of the answer is depend on uh, political and economic level. Uh, how the first main mission to the mast will be organized. Okay, Professor Gunga, do you want to add something? Um, I actually would uh, fully uh, support the uh, comment from Dr. Orloff because I think this is really um, a chance for the international community as well to show how great we can work together and how the different knowledge and experience can be used to really successfully uh, perform such a um, interplanetary mission. Because I think for the moment, the different countries have different experiences, like Russia is, uh, has during these uh, extensive long-term missions, they have uh, a very, very deep understanding of uh, humans isolated and confined. and. Uh, some other countries have a technical reason or medical approaches, so I think it's a, it's a great chance to do this international and uh, by no means should be dedicated to a national uh, mission at all. Okay, thank you very much. Now a question for our radiation team. Do any novel concepts exist with respect to shielding? Please, I, I start with Professor Kaligayev in the room and then I'll give the floor to the internet. Uh, actually, uh, now uh, we understood that uh, people in space uh, are under a risk of radiation and uh, we should uh, create some uh, new ideas about the shielding of people. Uh, first of all, we can consider uh, the new materials. Uh, new materials can prevent penetration of the uh, particles inside the uh, satellite or inside the shield. Uh, uh, actually, uh, if we uh, look about the uh, more uh, wide uh, shielding, uh, this is not a good idea because uh, when the shielding is uh, uh, high, uh, we can uh, secondary particles and influence of these particles often more dangerous uh, uh, for the astronauts uh, than for the thin uh, shielding. Uh, uh, so new materials, some nanomaterials uh, can help us uh, to, uh, to provide more, uh, uh, more good shielding. Another ideas are uh, 
uh, technological. We have some ideas about the magnetic uh, shielding, uh, so we should uh, create some magnetic field like magnetosphere around the Earth, um, uh, more low, of course, uh, that prevent the penetration of particles. But this is very uh, such uh, uh, such technological object is very he heavy, uh, and now we uh, cannot propose. Uh, good uh, technological, um, uh, good techno technology to create such shielding. Another idea, maybe electrostatic shielding, uh, when we provide electrostatic charge on the surface of satellite, that also decline the particles. But this is also a very difficult problem, and now uh, we don't have uh, some approaches to resolving it. Uh, I think that uh, we should uh, uh, hope on the future, uh, on the future technologies that can help us. Thank you. Please, somebody else, Professor Douglas, do you want to say a couple of words? I think that uh, Professor Kalegaev was exhaustive. Okay. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Okay, Professor Luo. No, we just make microphone, please. Okay, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I heard someone uh, propose uh, magneto uh, magnetic uh, shielding, such uh, just like our magnetosphere of the Earth to. Uh, 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 to reduce uh, the, the dose of uh, cosmic rays is uh, one of the proposed novel shielding. I, I have no other uh, comments. I, yeah, thank you. I, 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 as, as myself a radiation person, I would just add that we are again living in the environment which we underestimate. We are shielded by the from space radiation by the atmosphere, which is 100 kilometers uh, high, and by F magnetic field, which is several tens of thousand kilometers high. And uh, we, but when we go to outer space, we need to protect by the, uh, ourselves by the objects which are doable, da? which are meters at most. If it is magnetosphere, it is kilometers. Mini magnetosphere, it is kilometers. So we, by far, cannot produce the shielding that uh, is, pro is provided by natural means at the Earth. So we have just six minutes and I will uh, ask, I, I, I'm asking everybody a, a, a question which, and I will ask you, you to answer just how much, very brief. So the question is how long will be people able to stay in space ultimately in the distant future? Your scientist, scientific wishful thinking so please, Professor Alok, short answer. For ages. But the question is the question of price, uh, possibility of human body to adaptate to wetlessness condition and the prophylaxis system. Okay, Professor Kalegaev. Uh, I think it depends on the conditions. Too many, uh, too many factors influence on the uh, on the uh, staying in space. Um, actually, uh, if uh, <laughs> the people should be healthy, uh, I think it's no longer than one year. Thank you. Uh, Professor Gunga. Well, I think they could stay longer if we have uh, certain precautions, like we have for certain environments uh, created or caves where they can live. I think they can stay even longer, and um, I think that will be necessary. If we, we really want to explore Mars, then we have to really think of several years later on uh, to stay there. And I think that will be possible. I'm, I'm uh, quite optimistic in that way, that we are able to solve uh, those issues uh, in the near future. Thank you. Professor Douglas. Thank you. Uh, well, if we are talking about Mars, 
if we are talking about Mars and Mars colony, I think that uh, in case we would be able uh, in the future to uh, implement an artificial magnetosphere, which was already mentioned as an innovative uh, shielding method by Professor Kalegaev, then uh, I, my, my guess would be that uh, people could stay there for longer times, for many years. And uh, with the slow, with the gradual addition of the body to the conditions on Mars, I guess that uh, we, in the far future, we could have generations even living on Mars. And finally, Professor Liu, your opinion. Okay, thank you. I think it, it depends on our techni technology on shielding. But I think uh, in the near future, we may stay on Mars uh, for several years, even more than 10 years. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, uh, our speakers. We are almost on time. We have two minutes left for a coffee break. And uh, thank you very much to the audience. It is a very, very nice conference, very, very nice place to meet and to see. And I'm happy all our panelists are optimistic about human presence in space. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anatoly, and a great thanks to all the speakers. It's re really encouraging to hear the opinion of the specialists that are quite optimistic in terms of how long we'll go. Humans will be able to stay in outer space. Um, that's all very encouraging. Thank you very much. This uh, is the first session that was actually closing in two minutes before the end, so we have two minutes more of coffee break, and that's where I would like to invite you now. But I would like to remind you that at 11 o'clock, our conference will continue with the six technical parallel sessions, and here in the room we'll have another very interesting Global Networking Forum. So please make sure that you are in the rooms of your choice some minutes before 11. Thank you very much.